have about how to apply or what happens when you get admitted. Um, we're so glad that you could join us today. This is our final live stream for the year and we're really happy to be here and be doing this. Um, you can ask your questions in the chat and uh, let us know where you're coming from and uh, how how your application is going. We are not able to answer super specific questions about your eligibility or things like that. However, if you have any general questions for university admissions about where to find information and how to pay your application fee, this sort of thing, uh, we'll be able to answer it live. Uh, you'll also be able to find this video afterwards if there's anything that you want to go back and rewatch uh, on our YouTube channel and on our Facebook account. So let's bring out our two wonderful co-hosts and say hello to them. Hi. Hi, everyone. <laughs> hello. So good to be here. Definitely. Should we introduce ourselves a little bit? I can start. Yes. My name is Marlene and I work for University of Missions in Sweden. And we are actually a part of a public authority called the Swedish Council for Higher Education. So that's the group behind University of Missions. And um, I've been working with communication international students since I think 2009, so quite a long time now. Um, and I'm the one responsible for everything you read on university admissions and, and presenting information that you need in order to be able to apply. So that's where my, my expertise comes in. You write a lot of information and you learn a lot of things that way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but then we have Ida, our real expert. Ooh, thank you for that introduction. No pressure. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm Ida. I'm admission officer at University Admissions that I see and uh, well also Swedish Council for Higher Education where I've been working since I thought I said nine years back when I talked to you earlier and mm -hmm. uh, yeah so I can I think I can answer most of your questions to be honest. Yeah I'll, uh, thank you so I'll much for joining us Marlene and Ida. Um, I think we've already got a question that would probably be a great place to start off. Um, somebody has asked when is university admissions open? And I assume they mean the application process and how do they apply? Should I take that one? I actually have to look here because I know we have a little bit of uh, the different dates here because one it's of the- It's open, but I think yeah. it's, uh, tomorrow is going to be like the full mm -hmm. uh, program, like all the programs and courses are going to be available yeah. from tomorrow. Sometimes it's interesting with our dates and there's a neat video that we just did together with SI just last week. Um, mm -hmm. And one of the things that we brought up there was that the dates are almost always that we open the 16th of October and the last day to apply is 15th of January. And you have to have your documents and pay your application fee by the 1st of February. But we don't like people to have to do things on the weekend. And that is really yeah. true. It was really <laughs> cool because he was like, you have, to com you have to combine work with play, which was a really cool point. But this year we opened Opened, I think it was October 17th instead because the 16th, uh, 18th, was, a, 18th, yeah, cause the 16th was a Saturday. Yeah. And then mm -hmm. the last day to apply this year and 17th on the 15th is the 17th. So yeah. you've got a few extra days. <laughs> but, but the 1st of February is still there. First That's of the last day there. to pay your application fee and to submit mm -hmm. your documents. Okay. And, we, and I can just say one thing too, because we get mm -hmm. a lot of questions from people that are like, well, what is the difference between 15th January and this 1st of February? Like, why, mm -hmm. why isn't everything all due on the same day? And I can say it this way, your electronic application. So selecting your courses and programs, um, creating your account, submitting that to university admissions, that you have to have done by the middle of January. But you still have until 1st of February to get your documentation together. Uh, upload them to university admissions. Most people can do it that way, but not everyone, which we're going to talk a little bit about later. And you need mm -hmm. to pay your application fee by the 1st of February. So that's mm -hmm. really the difference between those those two dates. We get that mm -hmm. question quite a lot. Mm. Yeah. Should we, if there's somebody watching who is completely unfamiliar with the, the Swedish application system in Sweden, should we just give a little bit of an idea of what university, university admissions actually is? Mm -hmm. Uh, because it might be quite different to the application systems where they're coming from. Yeah, sure. And I was thinking maybe I could share my screen as well. Um, yes. One of the first things that I can say that's really fantastic about applying for uh, admission in Sweden is you can do everything on one website, which we're mm -hmm. pretty proud of. It's really cool. So you can apply to all of our universities, all the programs and courses 
at, at one in the same place, which is great. Some people that can't believe it, I don't think they're like, but I must have to, you know, look <laughs> around and do other things. No, it's very important, of course, to look at the university websites, but you can apply and do everything on university admissions. I thought mm. maybe I would share it. It's always funky to share screens. <laughs> <laughs> live there it is you can see exactly <laughs> what, what i was looking at my cheat sheet here Ooh, but this is i just went to key dates and deadlines and looked at autumn semester dates but we can take a quick look at university admissions so you get a general idea of how the website works um we have a huge search bar on the first page because finding courses and programs is really important um you also have on studying sweden.sc a really mm -hmm. good um program search um so you can go and look at and look for courses and programs there as well but if you already know what you're looking for you can just use the search bar here or you can click on find courses and go to a filter you can use to search for just courses or just programs you can choose a specific university you're interested in a certain subject you're interested in. You can also select a level. If you know that you want to apply for master's level courses, you can just select those. And every time you do that, you get a little bit of a, a better um, list of courses and programs that match your what you've filtered on. Um, I won't say too much more about that. A little bit more about the start page. We have probably, these are something we call flash puff out in Swedish, flash puffs. <laughs> but here we put in little important dates or things you need to know. So these are good to keep an eye on. And these are just general, uh, these are the, this is the information that people want the most really and are looking for. If you're applying to master's, a good place to start is to click there. This is a fantastic thing we put together with, with uh, SI, who we're here with today, um, how to start the admissions process. This is a fantastic guide to look at. We have frequently asked questions. You might find what you're looking for there. Uh, mm -hmm. And then just some other ways to get into the website. But I can show you. I uh, It's funny because I created an account a little while ago. And this Hamish Whiteley is actually a cat. <laughs> <laughs> so it's always good to create accounts that you were with, not with real people. Um, all of my cats have had an admissions account. Uh, my family and <laughs> friends, children. I can tell you none of them have come in yet because being eight years old makes it a little bit difficult. But it's always nice to have your cats busy. <laughs> This menu here is where all of our backup information is. And Ida and I were talking a little bit about what's the most important to, uh, and a little bit of pages we can recommend that you definitely take a look at. If you need to know the dates, I just showed you that. But entry requirements was pretty important. And Ida, remember we were, we were talking about English language requ requirements as something that's a very important page because you get a lot of questions about this, don't you? Oh yeah, so many. Mm. <laughs> And here you can take a look at, there's really three ways that you can meet the English English uh, uh, that's necessary for the course or program you applied to. You may be able to meet it through previous upper secondary studies, maybe for some countries. You may also be able to meet the English requirement through previous university studies. And you can always take an English test. And we have the most popular English tests. These are not ones that we that we think that you should take, but these are the ones that we, that we get in. So you can take a look at what scores are are necessary the English test so this is a really good page to take a look at um, and mm -hmm. one of the things that we were talking about Ida right is is well, you get a lot of questions about this can I just send in a certificate or letter from my school or university and it doesn't work that way does it no um, a lot of uh, people think that if you have studied your university degree in English it's okay to just have a university issued letter or certificate that confirms this but in most cases, we do we don't accept that. So, mm -hmm. in those cases, you need to make to do the tests. One of the tests. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that that we can do here, a nice little segue way to go from this to you're probably asking yourself, well, how do I know just exactly what it is that that I need to do? I've studied in this country, for example, I studied in the US, so I have my my uh, degree from the United States. Well, what is it that I would need to do? Well, we have made some fantastic things there for you to look at. Let's <laughs> pretend that I'm looking at, or we'll say Hamish, the cat, is looking to apply for a master's because he's already finished his bachelor's studies. He's a smart little guy. And here you can see, we won't go through it, but this is step-by-step -step creating an account here at University Missions, uh, little tips on how to search for courses and programs. We'll talk about ranking your selections because that's a very important thing. Mm -hmm. And providing application documents is, of course, a huge step. We also have information about paying your application fee if you're from the EU, how you can document your citizenship so you don't need to pay the application fee, and just some things for people who've applied before or if 
if you're applying a little bit late. This I want to take a look at because provide application documents. We have a general page on what you need to, to send in. And this is pretty much for everyone. But we've put together and Ida and I work a lot on this together, I can say. Don't we, Ida? I don't even know how many oh, emails yeah. we send back and <laughs> forth to each other. But oh, yeah. country oh, instructions. Please. Mm -hmm. And this is a fan. Everyone really needs to take a look at the information for their specific country. For example, mm -hmm. I'm from the U.S. I'm from the U.S. So if I scroll down to the U.S. and go to the United States page, you can find out what you need to have studied previously to meet the the general. Uh, what do you call them? And entry requirements. requirements. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, and the minimum, of course, is a bachelor's degree. And this is from a regionally accredited U.S. college or university. Mm -hmm. You can find out specifically how you can meet the English. And it tells you from upper secondary, uh, from if you have a GED, university studies. You can also take a test. There's general document things that you need to send in. Everyone needs to, to send in. But for the U.S., there's also special things that you need to do if you studied in the U.S. Um, one thing, you don't need to translate your documents because documents in English are okay, but there are special things here you need to think of. And and one of the most important things, we were just talking about this, right, Ida? One of the common mistakes that people make is that for certain countries, you have to send in your transcripts directly from the university to university admissions in Sweden. And the U.S. is one mm -hmm. of them. And you can explain maybe why that is. People wonder. Well, usually it's because that's how it works in the country itself. So in the United States, uh, when you apply for masters in the United States, uh, the universities there send the transcripts uh, to yep. the university you apply to. Mm. So yeah. here's some instructions on how to do that. Uh, their name and birth date must match on all documents. A lot of times people create uh, uh, or write in their information and they have nicknames, for example, that don't match their, their academic uh, documentation mm -hmm. they send in. It's very important that the name that you've reported to us and the birth date matches on all your documents. If it doesn't, you've been, if you've been married, for example, since then, you just need to send in information about why the names don't match. Is this mm -hmm. a common problem, would you say, that documents and um, names don't match? It's, well, it's more... It's more of a problem from different uh, countries, I think. And it's also, uh, we have a few uh, countries where it's um, a problem with the uh, birth dates, where it could be mm -hmm. a different birthday on the university transcripts compared to the birth date in passports. It's, and we need to be able to confirm that it's the same person uh, mm -hmm. that has the transcripts and also has this ID in the application. So it's very important to, to make sure your university has the right information on your documents before submitting mm -hmm. them. And who needs to have their documents translated? You can explain that maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can explain. So, um, well, in general terms, uh, documents in English that are issued in English are fine. So if the university issues directly in English, you don't need to translate it to Swedish or anything. Mm -hmm. um, otherwise, it's it's so important to read. I don't think I can put enough effort speed. on like how to read, like you have to read the whole country specific instructions uh, because all the country instructions have a headline that says translation requirements. Mm. Um, so go. for some countries, it's, um, it's possible to send, for example, the diploma in original language, but the transcripts needs to be translated. That's for example, mm -hmm. if the transcripts are in French, they need to be translated, but the diploma doesn't need to be translated. Okay. So this country specific information is extremely important to everyone who applies. Yes. In other words, <laughs> get <laughs> in there and take <laughs> a look. That's very important to look there. And, and I'm not going to go into more details about different. We think that you should read everything, honestly. But, you know, mm. one of the biggest mistakes I think people make is they start to read and you get a little bit sort of, OK, I know what I'm going to do and I'm going to go and I'm just going to go ahead and send this stuff yeah. in. And if you had read the instructions, it probably would have helped you. I'm going to show you one more thing that we think is very important, um, and that is the information on the university's website about the course yeah. or program you'd like to apply to. Here I've got, these are just, they come up in alphabetical order, but adapt and semantic web. Considering that I'm not really sure what this is at all, I'm, I don't think that Hamish the cat knows either. Maybe he does, and he's very <laughs> interested in this course. He may be, but here <laughs> always open up and and um, click on show more because you can get some great information about the course here. How many mm. credits it is, the application period, 
how much the tuition fee would be, um, course dates, what level the course is, the language of instruction, almost all, I, I think maybe even all of the courses and programs that you look at on university admissions, the language of instruction is English. This website mm. is specifically for international students. It's not a, a translation site with English information. This is for international students. So we, mm -hmm. we focus on that. Um, if the course is on campus, we have distance courses, of course, as well. Uh, pace of study when it's during the day uh, and different subject areas that that the course uh, covers. But this is another important link. If we told you to look at the country page, we want you to click here as well, because if you click on this link, you'll go to Linnaeus University's website and here you will find everything you need to know about this exact course or program, including if they require some different kind of documents, such as mm. uh, maybe recommendation letters or a CV. Uh, don't send those things in if no one has asked for them, but you should always check to see if it's something that you need to submit. Mm -hmm. So it could be here that there's a syllabus for the course. Um, there's lots of good information here. I probably picked one. Here's an entry requirements. They tell you exactly that you need 30 credits at the A1 level in media technology. I don't think Hamish has studied this before, so he would not be, he should not apply to this because he doesn't need this 30 credits. I think maybe he only has 10. <laughs> oh boy! Oh, <laughs> Here's information about bad. tuition fees. Too bad. So these but, are this is, this yeah. Is really can important. I just add a, because I saw someone asked the questions regarding like should I submit my transcripts and course syllabus? No, don't only submit your transcripts unless it says something about course syllabus on this page that Marlene just showed you, like on the mm -hmm. university website on the course website. Does it say anything about course syllabus? Then you may submit it, but otherwise, only transcripts, please. Here, for example, requirements and selection. Uh, it doesn't look like, I just can tell you to read everything here. They will tell you exactly what you need to submit and how on this course and program page. Very important. Yeah, I think I'm gonna stop sharing because I've given you the main uh, tidbits that we said we wanted to take a look at. Maybe you could show just on university admissions quickly where they find, um, what documents they need to submit, the the ah, base documents. Oh, sure. I'm getting good at, at sharing. <laughs> so good. Uh, you, I would look at the country pages, but you can also look, for example, now we'll look if you're applying to bachelors. And a lot of this is the same information as applying to, to masters. But if you take a look at provide application documents, find out what you submit, what you need to submit is the general information about what you need to submit. Yes. exactly depends on the university for some courses and programs and they'll let you know if you have additional documents and the country where you studied is why you need to look at the country mm -hmm. page but the basics are here as well and Ida what is it that they basically need to submit for applying to a bachelor's program uh, you need to submit your upper secondary uh, degree uh, and what documentation that is is said on the country specific page mm -hmm. uh, if you've also studied at university but still are applying to bachelor's level you should submit your university documentation as well because it might be necessary for meeting the specific entry requirements perhaps mm -hmm. But don't just submit your university documents because no. in order to get a place, you have to compete based on your grades. And if you don't submit yeah. your upper secondary grades, you won't be able to do that. I think yeah. a lot of people think Sweden is very like different in that area <laughs> that we, we want to look at your upper secondary degree, even if you have a master's level degree. But that's mm -hmm. the case. If you apply to a bachelor's level program or course, we want to see your upper secondary degree. Perfect. Austria. And um my colleague Julia, who is moderating the chat for Study in Sweden, has also put in the links to all of these pages in the chat. So Fantastic. anyone watching who wants to click directly there can uh, just scroll through and find that. OK, should we talk a little bit about tuition uh, application fees and tuition mm -hmm. fees and who's sure. required to pay and who's not required to pay? I think that most people have a pretty good idea nowadays of, of what that means. Mm -hmm. But, but um, you, the, the applicants that are required to pay the application fee are applicants who are not uh, a citizen of an EU or EEA country or a citizen of Switzerland. Um, if you're not a, a citizen of any of those countries, you'll need to pay the application fee. It's 900 Swedish kronor. Uh, 
which is about 90 euro, $90, somewhere around there. But you only pay at one application fee for all the courses and programs you've applied to. So it covers mm. everything, which is actually <laughs> cheaper than paying the normal <laughs> application fees if you apply to you know, 10 different schools at someplace else or even five different schools or something. Yeah. You can um, pay your application fee right on university admissions. We recommend that you use uh, a credit card. It's the, definitely the easiest way. It goes very mm -hmm. quickly, very safe to do that. You can pay by um, transferring funds from your bank. We don't recommend it, but for some people, that's the only way that they can do it and it works just fine. But there are very clear instructions on university admissions about how to do that. Make sure you print out these instructions and take them with you to your bank because they'll help you with making sure that you have, if you're gonna, if you have, uh, your country has a different currency, how that can be translated to Swedish Kronor, making sure mm -hmm. you pay, there's always a fee that you have to pay to transfer money, uh, but we have all the information you need right on, right on university admissions. Perfect. And um, for the students who are required to pay application fees, there's no kind of application fee waiver that we offer. Everyone has to pay. No, we don't have that. I would mm -hmm. say, unfortunately, because I understand that it can be it can be difficult to to come up with the application fee for for a lot of individuals. I know you guys also get that question a lot for those who mm -hmm. apply for a Swedish Institute scholarship. Mm -hmm. But even for the scholarship, you have to pay the application fee in order to mm -hmm. um, apply for admission and then apply for the scholarship. Exactly. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, okay, so we can go through some more questions. You've uh, touched upon um, the fact that you can apply for numerous programs and courses with the one application and you only pay uh, the application fee one time. How many programs can each student apply for if they're applying to a bachelor's or master's? And what is the ranking system? What does it all mean? For masters, it. it's four programs that you can apply to, and for uh, the courses and programs at bachelor's level, it's eight courses programs. Mm -hmm. And they can be at different universities or at the same university yes. in Sweden, correct? Mm -hmm. Correct. But we should definitely talk about ranking, ranking. because this was mm -hmm. just bizarre. And when I moved to Sweden, I moved to Sweden, <laughs> it was 24 years ago. It was a long time ago. I'm not as young maybe as you all think that I am, <laughs> but uh, I could not understand mm -hmm. it because I think a lot of us come from countries where uh, the normal process is to apply to every university and and then you just find out whether you've been accepted to the course or program at every university and then you can decide based on that. But we have a different process here in Sweden. and what happens is if you apply for masters, for example, your first choice is the one that we look at first. That's your favorite. That's the one you'd most like to, mm -hmm. to get, a, get a place in. And this is important for scholarships as well, because if you apply for a scholarship, make sure you have that, that program ranked number one so that we look at that first. But we'll look at that program. If you're eligible and you can compete, you compete for a place and you're awarded a place, then you'll then all the rest of your selections will be they'll disappear because mm -hmm. we, we consider that this is your favorite. This is the one you wanted to get into. You've gotten into it and now we're done. We mm -hmm. won't continue to look at two, three, and four and give you an answer about all four, just about number one. Mm -hmm. If you So you'll only be admitted to one program exactly. if you are admitted. Mm -hmm. And it's not possible to change the ranking after the deadline. Is that correct? You can change the ranking up until the application deadline. Yeah, you can after that if you want to, but I wouldn't recommend it because if you if you to in order to change the rack ranking, you have to delete the course or program and then add it back in. And then you have a late application and then your mm -hmm. chances are much, much lower. So please mm -hmm. don't go and start doing that. But really think carefully about what order you'd like to rank them, because it would be a shame if you ranked your favorite number four and you came in to even even number two and then number four is going to, to disappear, as I said. So you don't yeah. have a chance to, to get into that again. Um, if you don't get into the first one, we'll look at number two, then number three and number four. So we look at them all. Yeah. And if you get admitted to number two, you and you but you were eligible also to number one, you have a, a reserve placement. I was mm -hmm. put in queue for the first one. Mm -hmm. um, I was going to say there's also like a misunderstanding uh, among some people that if one person ranks a program as number one and another applicant pr ranks the same program as number two, that the one that has ranked it as number two has like less of a chance to get admitted. Mm -hmm. But that's not how it works. No. So it, 
it doesn't like we don't value where you place the mm. the university's feelings are not going to be hurt no. by giving them a lower <laughs> no <laughs> democracy is very big in sweden i can tell you and even with the admissions process that's one of the things that's fascinating is that everyone has exactly the same chance everyone comes in on the same you know you everyone sends in the same information and everyone competes exactly on 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 what they've their their previous uh, studies so it's i think it's fantastic i don't mm. ever have to worry about someone maybe having a better chance because uh, we've even had questions sometimes that people have asked i'm from so and so country am i allowed to apply of course you are any you can apply from anywhere um we're happy to have your application and we'll look at it for you of course mm -hmm. Okay, so if an applicant is admitted to the program that they've applied for, how will they be notified and where will they be notified? They'll, they'll see it on their in their um, account at university admissions. When the day comes, and it's in April, that the admissions yes. results the are, master, are published. Yeah, for the master programs, the results are released on the 7th of April, and for the bachelor programs, it's on the 13th of April. Mm -hmm. Okay. And you'll go in and log in, and you'll see if you've been put on a waiting list for a course or program. Mm -hmm. If you're put on a waiting list, also important to know that the university will contact you if a place becomes available. We get a ton of questions. People People say I have waiting place number four what exactly is my chance and we would love to be able to tell you but we just don't know it could be a very popular course or program and everyone that gets a place is definitely going to say yes to it that and mm -hmm. you could be you could have place one on the waiting list and you're not going to get into the program mm -hmm. but that also changes from year to year a course that's really popular one year maybe isn't quite as popular the next so it becomes very difficult even to say if you're if, what chances you have of, of getting a place in the first place it all depends on how many people apply, what their stu pat previous studies look like. And um, you can, it, it changes from year to year. So it really is very mm -hmm. difficult for us to answer those questions. But mm -hmm. you'll find it all on university admissions. You can log into your account and you'll see next to, on the application page, you'll see whether you've come in as a waiting list or been accepted or if it's been deleted. Uh, and you can also, there's a PDF document that's your official uh, notification of selection results that you can use if you're going to be looking for an apartment, they often ask for the notification of selection results so that you mm -hmm. can show that you're going to be studying. Yep. So after students have applied, uh, because there's quite a long period of time between the, the 1st of February deadline and when they receive their application results in April, um, Ida, maybe you can explain sort of what happens during that period of time and how mm -hmm. students can receive updates about what stage their application is at. Oh, yes. Uh, where to start? I want to start by saying something that is so important, and that is like submit your documents now. Mm -hmm. Don't wait until the end, because if we get the documents now, we might be able to give you an assessment and give, reach back to you and say if anything is missing before the deadline. If you submit your documents and pay the application fee in January, we won't be able to give you any feedback on your documents, probably. Uh, mm -hmm. We have a lot of people emailing us already now asking, oh, my documents are like this. And um, do you think my Ang English will be accepted with this? We can't answer any questions without seeing the documentation. Uh, so submit your documents, pay the application fee as early as possible to get a chance of us reaching back to you. Mm -hmm. um, we can see when we see the patterns on how people apply and submit documents, most people submit their documents on the 16th of January, which is usually <laughs> usual deadline, and on the 1st of February. So yeah. in, in that case, like we just in the master's admission round, we assess 30,000 people. So it's very like there is a lot of documents that need to be assessed. Mm. So if you want to have a, like an answer to your documentation, if it's enough or not, submit it now. You won't get it later just read everything through so you make sure you submit everything that we ask for during um february it's uh, february to mid-march it's going to be us at university admissions that take a look at the documents to see if they meet the general entry requirements and after we've done our first assessment it will be the university's uh, time to check the specific entry requirements so if you have, uh, for example, if we send you a message and you don't understand uh, what we want, then you can contact us and we can try and explain further what's, um, what's missing. Um, mm -hmm. Or if 
you have questions regarding the specific entry requirements or how the universities are grading, um, like merits rating your degrees, mm -hmm. that's a question for the universities. Yeah. Okay, noted. And if a student has applied previously to the same program, but maybe wasn't admitted then, or uh, they were admitted, but weren't able to come, do they need to submit all of the documents again? No, uh, just make sure you have the same account as before. Uh, so if you have previously submitted your documents to one account, you don't need to submit them again, even if you are submitting a new application. Mm -hmm. um, it might be a good idea to just double check with us that everything is registered as mm -hmm. it should be, or if any documentation is missing. I believe we save documents, isn't it, for 10 years? Yeah, mm -hmm. according to law, we, we mm -hmm. have to have them for 10 years. So we keep okay. them so you don't have to send them in again. Nope. Unless you have something new you need to send in. If you've done something in the meantime, you can of course. send those documents. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, we've got a, a question from a student here who's saying they're reapplying to the same program, but they've received a new English proficiency exam with better grades, then they can still yeah. upload the new document, yeah. even if they've submitted a previous English uh, test result before. You should do it. Absolutely. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> That's good. Okay, well, we've got lots and lots of questions coming in, so I might just go through and um, if a person is applying to programs, several different programs, and they all ask for statements of purpose, do they need to submit multiple statements of purpose or can they submit one statement of purpose? I was almost, before you just said we're going to take some questions, going to talk about exactly this. And I, I knew that someone was going to probably answer the question. And I completely understand the question I do. And yeah. I think part of the confusion is that if you're sending all your documents to one place, is everyone going to be looking at everything? Mm. Um, you need to submit a statement of purpose that's individual for each, each program. They could be very similar, of course. It could be that the reason you want to apply for a program at one university is pretty much the same as for the other, but you need to submit a separate letter. And, and people worry that, well, what if they read the other ones? I can tell you right now that they have so many applications to look at. <laughs> they are not interested in looking at what you said to the other university. They're just okay. going to look at what you wrote to them. Mm -hmm. um, what I recommend is when you go and to upload documents, you name the document what you want to name it. And what we recommend is that you name it something that you'll remember what it is. For example, if you call the document, um, what did we just say? Statement of purpose, purpose, statement of what, what was it just called? Yeah, statement, statement of, of purpose. purpose. Statement of purpose. Mm -hmm. And then put <laughs> put Lund after it if it's to Lund mm -hmm. University or or mm -hmm. to Uppsala if it's to that university. And then you'll remember what it is. I can also mention that when you upload your documents, unfortunately, due to Swedish law, you cannot go in and look at the documents that you've uploaded. You can't do that. Um, mm -hmm. We're not able to be 100% sure that that's you. Uh, the law says that if you're going to look at documents about a person, you have to be that person and you have mm -hmm. to be able to prove it's you. In Sweden, what we do is we send a code to your official address in Sweden. So we know that and then you use the code, we know that that's you, but we can't really mm -hmm. do it for international students. So just be sure when you upload documents, what you name them, you remember mm -hmm. what it is so you know exactly what's in them and then mm -hmm. you won't have any problems. But they're, they're gonna, everything is is scanned and all the documents are scanned into the admission system. And they're just going to look for the documents, start it out with a statement of purpose to Lund University for program blah, that's all they're going to look at. I mm -hmm. promise you, they're not gonna look at anything else. <laughs> so if a student or an applicant, um uploads documents and then realizes that something was incorrect or they want to update the, the document, it, there's no way of going in and deleting the, no, the first no. ones. No. I but think just that, submit it again. Like it, it, it's not a problem. It's no problem. Okay. I think but what before you want the to, deadline. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. I think what you want to think about is if you were going to send, you know, if we look back in the old days, Back when I was in school, for example, if I wanted to send in documents, I had to put them in an envelope and put a stamp on the envelope and I had to send them in. And there's mm -hmm. no way that I would send in things I ish sort of thought were good and send them in and then just keep sending, you understand, more and more mm -hmm. until I had the right one. I would really think about what I was going to submit before I sent mm -hmm. in that, that envelope. Do the same thing even when you're uploading mm -hmm. your documents. I know it's tempting to just think, well, I, I'll mm -hmm. put this up there and then maybe I'll change it 50 times between then. Don't do that. Try to think mm -hmm. to yourself, 
is it that I really want to submit? Mm. But as Edith said, if there's a mistake, just send in the new one. You can call it, for example, updated version of, and, and then we'll yeah. understand what it is instead. Mm -hmm. And also we don't require everything to be submitted at the same time. For example, if you have your IELTS in January, you can still submit your academic documents now so we can assess them. And you yeah. might get a message from us that says, oh, you're, you're missing the English level, but you know that you're going to take your IELTS in January. So just mm -hmm. Like be chill and submit your IELTS <laughs> results as soon as you have them before 1st of okay. February. And uh, yeah. Okay. We have another question here from a student who wants to apply for a master's program, but hasn't graduated from their bachelor's program yet. Mm. Yeah. Uh, can they still apply? Yes, please do. Mm. Uh, as what we need is usually to have like a, a certificate. We have a form on the website we do uh, we have a form on university missions can uh, mm -hmm. just fill in and submit to just we want um some sort of confirmation that uh, it is expected to have the degree before uh, starting the programs next autumn um we know there's no such thing as a guarantee that the universities can make but just an expectation that it's going to happen um and then yeah, it's going to be up to the universities. They're going to check for the specific entry requirements and then they're going to make you um, conditional. Conditionally admitted. Yep. admitted. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's the and word. then you just need to show your documents later. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. But this won't work for bachelors. No, nope. that was my next question. We have uh, another student who <laughs> knew it was going to be the next question. <laughs> bachelors doesn't work. And the reason for that is when, when, master's information is looked at there. Are, it isn't really a, a basic grade point average that's always looked at. But with bachelor's, there has to be a grade point average so that you can compete with other applicants for a place. And it has to be your final school grades. And if you apply by the first, uh, you're signing your documents by the first of February, if you're in your last year of upper secondary studies, you haven't finished, you don't have your final school grades yet. So you don't have a, a merit rating, we call it grade point mm -hmm. average that you can compete with. So it would be such a waste if you paid 900 kronor for an, an application fee, and there's just no way that you can be awarded no, a place. I can good. mention something else too. these two admission rounds that we have, yes. because I think this relates a lot to mm -hmm. this first round, second round, the first round, which has these 15 uh, January, 1st, February dates or 17 this year, mm. or 18 this year. <laughs> that is different. technically it's called it. We can call it the international application round. And that is all of the courses and programs that are taught in English are offered during this admissions round. And this is specifically for international students. So we recommend that everybody applies to this round. But we also have the regular Swedish application round, which we call the second round. And what some universities do, if they have places still available in certain courses and programs, they will go and, and put these courses and, and programs into this application round as well. And they have later dates, much later dates, actually. Um, we open for application around the 15th of March. 15th of April is the application deadline. And documents don't have to come in until, for some, even the first week in July. But the but the situation here is that you can you can you'll have your final school grade you'll be able to complete for uh, compete for a place and get your admissions results in July, but if you're from outside of the EU or EEA you have to apply for a residence permit and you're just not going to have enough time to get that taken no. care of. So no. we really don't recommend that students from outside the EU EEA apply to this second round because again, it's a, such a shame to pay the application fee, you get your admissions results, but you have no time to get your residence permit. So we don't recommend that you do that, but no. EU EEA uh, shouldn't be any problem at all. So you can wait until you're done with your bachelor or your upper secondary studies, and then you can apply for a bachelor's, you apply for bachelor's programs in mm. that round as well. Anything mm. I'm is there, Ida? No. Um, if you are in your last year of, of high school or upper secondary, um, then you can apply in the second admission round if you're a EU citizen, as Marlene said. And then I think the deadline is 5th of July to mm -hmm. submit documents. So a few mm -hmm. don't get their documentation until after that. And then it's too late, even for the second admission round. You have to wait another mm -hmm. year or apply for a spring semester. And one of the things I guess that students could should consider um, if they're going to apply in the second later admission round is that it'll give them a lot less time to prepare to move to Sweden yeah. and find right. housing and all of mm -hmm. this kind of thing, um, which can be very difficult in these uh, student cities.
Oh, yeah. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Okay, so somebody has asked uh, documents like statement of purpose and the CV and things like that, they're not required by the university. Will it increase their chances of being admitted if they submit them? No, they won't even look at them. No. We're really strict about things like that. <laughs> and I can no. tell you a very funny, it's not a funny story, it's actually a cute story, but there was someone who, uh, we had an applicant, and I don't know if you remember this, Ida, it was a long time ago when we first started to have uh, an uploading of documents, and there was someone who submitted, I think it was about 120 pages, and a lot of it was just pictures <laughs> of his life, and it was so sweet, and it was really nice, but it was not really necessary at all because it didn't it didn't help their chances at all. I think he had an awful lot about previous work experiences and places mm -hmm. he'd gone and it mm -hmm. was fascinating. But it we're very democratic, as I said. What we say we're going to review, that's what we review, and we don't look at other things. The more you send, it, it won't help anything at all. Mm -hmm. But that was it was fun to look at, but you don't need to send them for my sake. So please don't. <laughs> <laughs> Um, someone is asking here, do they apply for scholarships through university admissions? No. Unfortunately, no. We've had we've had a great idea come in from we do surveys or uh, questionnaires every few years. And we always get someone or several people who say, wouldn't it be great if you could do everything on university admissions? And we agree with that. But right now, that isn't how it works. But mm. we have some information about scholarships because we get a lot of questions about it. But university admissions doesn't work with the scholarship process whatsoever. No. And that's where you guys come in, study in Sweden, of course, because mm -hmm. you're more involved with that at your agency, right? Exactly. So students can apply for scholarships through study in Sweden uh, if they're eligible or through the universities directly. Um, however, they still need to submit an application through university admissions and then a separate scholarship application to Swedish Institute and the universities. Um, yep. Okay, can you apply for PhD positions uh, through university admissions? No, no. PhDs are also very interesting and a little bit different <laughs> in Sweden. It's like a, we keep saying it's very different in Sweden. It's it's mm. not so different, but it sounds like it is. But PhD positions are a lot more like actual job positions in Sweden. So when you apply for a PhD at a university, you're actually employed at the university. Mm -hmm. And so if you're interested in PhD programs, what you'll have to do, uh, study in Sweden.se has some very good general information about mm -hmm. PhD programs with great links for where you can go and look at the different listings for um, exactly. jobs that are available. But it's to the actual university that you'll apply for the PhD program. So we have absolutely nothing to do with that. But I can say that there's no application fee to apply for PhD programs. There's none for that. Mm -hmm. Just bachelor's and master's level. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, okay, so uh, is there any age limit to applying to master's or bachelor's programs in Sweden? No age no. limits. No age limit. And if somebody uh, studied uh, at university 15 years ago or a while ago and has been working since, is there any, can they still apply? To yes, study of again. Course. Oh yeah, definitely. Yes. No problem. Okay, and there's no there's no disadvantages. They're not going to be placed under anyone who's been studying more recently. Nope. Then nope. we would be breaking the laws of Sweden. Think <laughs> think democracy again. <laughs> but it's 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 the this is probably the fairest place I've ever been. I've actually said to some people that it is so fair and democratic in Sweden that sometimes it almost seems like it isn't fair when you have a special situation, you know, you're like, Well, I worked for 20 years and uh is that the kind of thing that no, and it, mm. it, there really isn't any advantage. You just have to have your mm -hmm. previous grades. We need to see how you did and if you have the English skills that are required. That's really, mm -hmm. that's really it. Mm -hmm. um, and when it comes to English language tests, are there expiry dates on those? Um, yes. So it's most English tests are provided by companies that have mm -hmm. uh, set a limit to their own tests. So IELTS and TOEFL, for example, I think have two years of limits. So what we require is that we are able to verify the test online. So when you need to, I saw a question <laughs> uh, that regarding like, do I need to submit my test results or can I just like say to the company to provide it to you? Uh, you need to submit your PDF as well. So submit your PDF and then we will be able to verify your results with the company. Uh, mm -hmm. 
because if you've made it available for us, we'll be able to verify it. Okay. Um, however, the the companies, if they are older, the tests are older than than two years, we won't be able to verify them. I know that's not the case with Cambridge, for example. So it's a bit different. Mm -hmm. uh, depends on what tests we're talking okay. about. Okay. If somebody wants to apply for more than four master's programs, can they just create a second account and pay a second application fee? No. No. You're Please only allowed do to that. have one account. <laughs> That's what's about to be fair. You can only mm. have one account. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, maybe because we've been talking for almost an hour now, um, maybe it we should just... feel like it. It feels like about <laughs> 10 <laughs> minutes. Let's, let's, let's keep going. <laughs> Maybe we can talk a little bit about what the most common mistakes are that applicants make when they apply and what your best advice is to students who are applying now. Yeah, we were just talking about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. OK, um, so I think there's so many different um, easy mistakes that are being made. And I think most mm -hmm. of the mistakes are being done because you haven't read properly the information that we have on the website because most of the information is there. I know it's a lot of information and it's it's easy to get confused, but please mm -hmm. just at least try and read everything, especially the country specific <laughs> instructions and the English language instructions, and maybe then you'll find your answer. And then mm -hmm. if you don't, please contact us and we'll try and explain. But I think that's a common mistake that most of our answer just includes links because we see that people haven't really uh, read it through properly. Uh, but another common mistake is, we touched upon it before, is that you submit a, a letter or a certificate confirming the English language. I also saw a question from someone that mm -hmm. asked if it was okay if their English teacher at university confirmed their English level, and no, that won't be accepted. It has to be some of the, we're pretty strict on mm -hmm. the information that you can see on the website is what it, that's what we're going to go. Mm. The entry requirements aren't flexible and the deadlines are not flexible. No. No. That's very true. Okay. I've been taking a look at some of the questions that are rolling here. That's the first time anyone mm. has ever said anything about my vibes, I can just say. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I want to say also that we love Molly and vibes as well. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's a common. <laughs> it's so great to work with a woman. Oh, boy. <laughs> But I can say it's interesting, and this is not, you know, to scold any of you, not at all, really not. But the good thing is that just about all the questions that you're asking, we've either answered here or you can mm -hmm. definitely find the answers on university admissions mm -hmm. for sure. And a lot of the questions that have come in, if you go to the country, your country page, you'll find the answer to the questions I'm seeing here. Mm -hmm. uh, there's so much good information there that will answer these these questions uh, that you mm -hmm. have. Uh, I, and not all of them. And I someone keeps a asking a question about an SOP doc. I don't know what an SOP is. That's a statement, statement of purpose. purpose. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, hand sign. I don't know. I, I don't think you do know. But isn't it one of those things that you can just, I don't know, maybe print it out and sign it. I don't think anyone's expecting you to no, do that. I no. don't think so. The no. university specifically doesn't say that you need to have the document signed or stamped then. I think it's fine to just type it out. I was out. trying to figure out what SOP was and I'm like, <laughs> I, have, I should have known. I'm ashamed of myself. Just that's good about question, it. though. That's important yeah. for the official documents, though, issued by the uh, universities that they should be signed officially. Yes. Issues. Yes. We um, have an FAQ on university admissions. I can tell you, mm -hmm. go into, um, it's called, oh my goodness, it's called university, why do I not know this? My head is University mm -hmm. Admissions Support Center. And if you go into the University Admissions Support Center, you can you can search or you can um, you can go and browse through questions. We answer a lot of things there as mm -hmm. well. And it isn't that we're trying, I mean, of course you can contact us if you need to, but we just find it to be such a shame that someone will wait three days Sometimes we get a lot of questions, and especially at the at our deadlines, there are tons of people who need help, mm. of course. But someone mm. will send in a will send in a, a question, and um, they'll wait a few days to get an answer. When I just sit there and think, but there's an there's an FAQ that you could go and read. Mm. Try to try to take a look at the website. Really, th there are so many things that you can mm. find the answers to there. Um, and if you can't find it, then of course contact us. Especially and there's a specific search function questions. and things like that too. Mm -hmm. um, somebody's just asked a good question here. Uh, if they've applied in previous 
application rounds and they want to apply again, do they need to create a new account or can they use a previous one? The previous one mm -hmm. works perfectly. Great. And then the documents are already there as we mm -hmm. discussed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is good. So um, how do students contact you if they do have questions that they just can't find the answers to on university admissions? Go to that university admissions support center. You can see yeah. there that you can you can send an email using a contact form. You can call us or you can also chat. Um, mm -hmm. Use one of those three methods. We recommend that you use calling last because that can take the longest to have someone that calls take a long time um, mm -hmm. so try to focus maybe on email or chat chat works very quickly but of course mm -hmm. if it's a complicated question and you'd like to talk to somebody just call us of course it's no problem yeah. at all yeah okay excellent um marlene you mentioned before that one of our digital ambassadors jed had previous has just recently put out a, a video that they've made um on our mm -hmm. youtube channel about the application process and it's really great i recommend that everybody has a watch of it um he's so good <laughs> yes. he's so good jed he's i don't even so know what good. to say that's right. So uh, here you can see uh, how to apply to study in Sweden is the name of the video. And Julia, do you have the link to our YouTube account? If you could send that out too, that would be fantastic. Uh, Marlene, Ida, thank you so, so much for joining us today. Um, I think it's been very informative and interesting and um Hopefully we've been able to answer everybody's questions. Uh, to everybody watching who's currently applying, good luck. And thank you so much for joining us. As I said before, you can um, re-watch this on YouTube and Facebook afterwards if you'd like to go back and uh, find the information. But everything can be found on the website. So yeah, best of luck and send in your application and documents straight away. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you, Ida. Thank you, Marlene. Thank you so much for today. Thank yeah. you. And I just yeah. had to do a screenshot of the Marlene vibes thing because I'm going to show that to everybody. <laughs> this, but you made my whole day. Thank you. <laughs> but it was so great to, to talk with all of you. And yeah. good luck. Yeah, and uh, we're looking forward to getting your applications. Yes. And, take yeah. care. and I should also mention that we're going to be doing a second webinar together just before the application mm -hmm. deadline early next mm -hmm. year. So to everybody who wants colleague Pamela to... is going to be here instead of me. Okay. She's just as brilliant as me. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Bye. Thank you so much for